Oh, me taku yapi, Grant Shingru, Amachi yapi, Naha, Yuha Chante Washtea, Nape Chiu Zapelo. Hello, relatives. Grant Shingru is what they call me. And all of you, I gladly take your hand and shake it. Um, greetings, everyone. Um, today I'm going to talk about. Lakota language and Emacs, and how free software and Emacs empowered me to write on the computer in the language of my ancestors. Um, start off the look with the story of Lakotiapi, the Lakota language. Um, the Lakota Dakota dialect area, um, for those of who you don't know, um, the Lakota Dakota people um, are also known as the Sioux and uh, the tribes cover an, an area of roughly 10 U.S. states and parts of Canada. And so this language is spoken over a wide range of, of area. Um, however, the U.S. government policy um, directly tried to silence this language. Uh, my father was taken to a boarding school and was punished for speaking um, his native language. Um, and so he didn't teach it to his children. Several generations of uh, Lakota and Dakota people and other tribes all over the country lost lost their first language, their native language. So today only around 2,000 um, first, first language native speakers are speaking Lakota. Um, however, there's language recovery projects that are empowering um, second language learners like myself to teach it to the new generation of children. Um, which brings me to my story. Um, I grew up without knowing my heritage. Um, I didn't know who my father was. Both my parents were white. Um, I discovered my biological family in around 2015. It was kind of a shock to me. Um, up until that point, probably the only time I'd heard the Lakota language was in the movie Dances with Wolves. Um, possibly some other times um, around Nebraska I'd heard it. Um, but even myself growing up, you know, pretty close to, to Lakota people and other Native American people, American Indian people, I kind of thought it was just dead. I thought the language was not alive anymore. Um, but in 2016, my daughter began her journey into this world and I, I was doing a lot of searching to find out like, what could I do? You know, not knowing my family, not knowing my culture, what could I do to try to bring that into our life? Um, and so I found out about these um, Lakota classes that were happening. I went up to Standing Rock um, in North Dakota and attended the Lakota Summer Institute for three weeks and began my journey to learn the language so I can try to pass it on. So this brings us to Emacs. Um, I could talk a lot more about my story. I'm sure there's a lot to say, but we're here to talk about Emacs. Um, I was already a free software user at the time, and at the Lakota Language uh, Institute, they, they were deli they were giving us software. There was a dictionary you could get on Android. Um, there was a, a keyboard for Android that you could type with. They had keyboard input methods for Mac and Windows, but I'm a Linux user, free software user, um, so I didn't have access to those things um, as, as easily as I could. and. Um, I do a lot of my thinking and note taking in Emacs and in org mode, and so being able to to write this to to um, to write things down to type on my own computer uh, was was pretty important to me. And I wasn't much of an Emacs hacker yet at the time. I I barely done anything, mostly just you know hacked on my config file. But this was a real chance for me to experience the the benefits of free software firsthand and not just to benefit myself but to potentially benefit um, everyone anyone interested in learning this language so um, emacs and that free software philosophy really empowered me so i began digging in um, i looked i began reading the the manual more closely as an American, I'm, I'm sad to say there's not a lot of other languages spoken or written where I'm from. 
so it's not common that I that I have to think about this with computers. Um, I know international people, you know, have had to come up with with interesting ways to to enter their text, and Emacs is probably a pioneer in that. I I'd like to know more about the history of this, but there's a whole section in the manual on international Emacs, um, and I began reading this, and it was talking about. Um, different input methods and and how many different languages were supported and how you could enter the text and how it supports the different characters and so on. Um, I even noticed a few languages support several input methods. Um, that became important for me later on as I was working on this. Many, many languages are already supported. So um, those of you who haven't looked into this yet, if you press control backslash, it will open up a selection menu for you to to select um, your input method and you can there's 207 listed here that's including the two that I've contributed um, so 205 on on a vanilla Emacs so that's a lot of languages supported by Emacs Emacs but there's so many more that could be um, and since Emacs is free software and it is what it is I knew that defining a new input method was surely possible um, unfortunately the the manual didn't describe it directly, or at least I didn't pick it up. So, um, you know, the new Emacs hacker that I was, I, I timidly dove down into the source code and discovered the Quail package. Um, so, back in the day, apparently there was Mule, which was like the multi. I don't, I don't know. It stood for something about language environments, and and it has evolved, and at some point. Um, some Japanese uh, coders created an input method called tamago, which means egg in Japanese. And uh, tamago evolved into quail, and they, in the comments you can see they talk about how the quail egg is eaten in Japan. It's a smaller thing, and the quail mode is like a nicer version of tamago, I guess. And there's a pun saying they hoped it would egg people on to create more input modes. And Quail is quite nice. I looked into it, um, and it, there's basically two things. You use Quail Define Package and Quail Define Rules. Um, so Quail Define Package, um, you can see here, is a function. It's probably a macro that takes a name, a language, a title, and some optional stuff, which I didn't really have to deal with. Um, Define name is a new quail package for input language. Title is a string to be displayed at the mode line to indicate this package. So I began trying to do Lakota input. Now, this is a whole thing on its own because the Lakota language was never written um, pre-contact. And post-contact, like there's several attempts at writing it in different orthographies, and there's drama around all of this stuff. Um, it's pretty common to have drama going on in, in any American Indian stuff going on. So um, as I was doing this, I started with the suggested Lakota orthography, which is actually called by its authors the the standard Lakota orthography. But its authors are um, are European. Um, the main author is a man named Jan Ulrich, and I appreciate all his work, and I'm grateful for the materials he's made available. But um, it's a little bit problematic because it's not an orthography created by our people, by Lakota people. So there's another one called the White Hat Orthography, which is created by Albert White Hat, who's a teacher um, from the Chichangu tribe. So I created two, and thankfully Emacs lets me do that. So it's pretty simple. Quail define package. I just say the package I want, and then all these nils and t's for options. I don't actually know what they mean, but it works. Um, I could look it up. And then quail define rules just defines mappings from ASCII keys to the, the, the text you want to put in. So for this one, there's a nasal N and then a dot and a macron, like a, a wedge shape for um, marking up the consonants. So that one's pretty easy. And then the su suggested Lakota orthography is a little bit more difficult, but still pretty easy. I just map a sequence of keys, A followed by the apostrophe, makes the accented vowels, so all of those. And then again, we have the hot checks for the guttural sounds of the language 
and the nasal N. So that's it. Basically, these two definitions allow me to type um, Lakota language in Emacs. Um, and it's great. It works great. Publishing it um, is another problematic thing. I wanted to use free software to do that. Um, so the first thing I did was I, I posted on SourceHut, which is great. It's a good alternative for a Git forge. And I got it published on Melpa. So the Lakota input package is available if you'd like to try it out. Um, and Bandali, one of our hosts for the conference, is helping me now through the process of committing the code to Emacs um, because I would like to do that. I would like it to be available to everyone through Emacs itself so that anyone who wants to use it just has to download Emacs and there you go. You can type Lakota language. So, Pilamayaye, uh, thank you all for listening and I hope to see you around in, in our Emacs community. Uh, Doksha ke, wachiyankinkte.